Welcome to the Japan Society's regular webinar on current affairs and business. I am Bill Emmett, and as most of you know, I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. In several discussions during the past year, we've paid special attention to gender inequality in the UK, but especially in Japan. We heard from Heather McGregor from Edinburgh Business School and Yoriko Goto of Deloitte about the work of the 30% Club, an organization launched in Britain a decade ago, but now worldwide, aimed at getting the share of women on boards and in senior management up to 30%. We saw how in the UK the target had been met for board directors, but not yet for senior managers, and how in Japan, with its more recently founded chapter of the 30% Club, women's share of board seats was now rising, but from a low base. We heard also from Kathy Matsui, then Vice Chair of Goldman Sachs in Tokyo, about her analysis, now over more than 20 years, of what she terms womenomics in Japan, about the progress that has been made, but also the huge potential economic benefit of allowing all the human capital embodied in women to be able to flourish more properly. And based on my own work, I added in that webinar that some of the issue is generational, based on huge inequities in access to university places between men and women in the 1980s, which now makes up Japan's leadership generation in very age-based hierarchies. There has been a dramatic change in women's entry into full university education in Japan beginning in the 1980s, so that now the gap is very small and there is a far bigger pipeline of professional women following careers and now in their 30s, 40s and early 50s. Mariko Bando, doyen of the gender equality issue and now president of Showa Women's University in Tokyo, predicts that women's share of leadership roles in Japan will double during this decade from the currently internationally low level of 12 to 13% to 25 to 30%, closer to international typical levels. And we also heard from Linda Gratton, Professor of Management at London Business School and a great expert both on the nature of work and on what she calls the 100 year life about how the pandemic stands to alter working practices and organizational thinking potentially to women's benefit. Today, we're going to look behind these macro trends, behind these numbers into some of the underlying obstacles, some of the psychological background to gender inequality all over the world, but certainly in both Britain and, to, and Japan. And to do that, I am welcoming two experts who both happen to be good friends of mine and who both have very re relevant new books out. Marianne Seacart is a journalist, broadcaster and visiting professor at King's College who was also until recently chair of the Social Market Foundation think tank. Her new book out next week looks at why women are taken less seriously than men, even by other women, as she says, and what we can do about it. The book is called The Authority Gap. And Ian Robertson, speaking from Dublin, is a neuroscientist and clinical psychologist who is a professor at both Trinity College Dublin and the University of Texas at Dallas. His new book, which was out in early June, is called How Confidence Works, The New Science of Self-Belief. And on the back cover, one of the particularly relevant lines asks, why do boys instinctively bullshit more than girls? Why indeed? As usual, our speakers will give 10 minutes of opening remarks, following which we will have a discussion and crucially your questions. Please, as usual, submit them using the Q&A function and feel free to vote for other people's questions so as to bring them faster to my attention. We'll start with Mary Ann Seacart. Over to you and welcome to the Japan Society. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, this is such an interesting subject and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this webinar, to this session. Uh, so my book, The Authority Gap, is about how much harder women have to work to be taken seriously than men do. Because most of us assume that a man knows what he's talking about until he proves otherwise. Well, for a woman, it's just so often the other way around. And so as a result, women often find that their ability is underestimated, their views are ignored in favor of men's, their expertise is challenged and their authority is questioned. And so instinctively, we just tend to take women less seriously than men. And the academic research backs all this up. The book is full of references to these studies as well as interviews and anecdotes from a lot of very successful women who I interviewed. 
Now, I should, of course, say not all women and not all men, of course, because some men are great at respecting women equally. And boy, do we appreciate it and notice it. And some women manage to exert authority with fantastic skill and success. But boy, do they have to be expert to achieve that. And, and I'll explain why it is so much more difficult for women than for men. Because the trouble is that it's so hard for a woman to come across right in a way that it isn't for men. So if a woman isn't confident enough, of course, she won't be taken seriously and people won't listen to what she says. But if a woman is confident and assertive, as confident and assertive as a lot of men are, so many of us, and, and I'm talking about women as well as men, will resist her and almost recoil from her because we'll see her, we'll use words like abrasive or strident or aggressive, bossy, overbearing, ball breaking, even bitchy perhaps about her. We will find her unlikable. So why is this? Why can't women come across as confident as men do? Well, it's because we still nurture these sneaky little stereotypes right in our unconscious brain that women ought to be warm and nurturing and unthreatening and uncompetitive and unself-promoting. So in social psychologist words, women ought to be communal, display communal traits. And if she acts in a way that smacks of the male stereotype, which is confident and assertive and showing leadership, or as social psychologists put it, being agentic, it makes us feel uncomfortable. And so we often dislike her as a result. And the trouble is that for women, likability is much more important than it is for men. So you might say, well, women should just have a thicker skin and who cares if people like them or not. The trouble is that uh, when it comes to promotion and hiring decisions, likability is much more important for women than it is for men, particularly if men are doing the hiring. And so men tend to be promoted and hired on the basis of competence and potential, but women much more on whether people find them likable. So if a woman wants people to accept her as being competent and authoritative, she has to work incredibly hard to be likable as well. She has to sort of ladle oodles of warmth on top of this competence and confidence in order for people to accept her. So there's such a narrow path therefore for a woman between seeming underconfident and therefore disrespected or overconfident and therefore disliked. And navigating that path is a real burden that men just don't face. And it's the same with all sorts of other things. So I've talked about confidence. And of course, one of the reasons why women often are genuinely less confident than men is because they come up against the sort of behavior that the authority gap produces, such as being underestimated, um, having their authority and their, and their expertise challenged, being interrupted, being talked over, having their views ignored. And if this happens to you the whole time, which it does for pretty much every woman, it's not surprising that your confidence is gonna be a bit undermined. So we also have to work harder to feel more confident in the first place. Uh, and it's very much the same with speaking time. So you might think, well, perhaps the, room, the, the reason women don't seem to carry so much authority is because they simply don't talk as much in public as men do. And that's certainly true. I mean, if you wire women and men up for the day, you will find they use roughly the same number of words. But in public settings, such as meetings, women definitely talk less than men, on average, that is. But what they're doing is completely rational because all the studies show that if a woman talks for exactly the same length as a man, people will perceive her to have dominated the conversation. And if women are seen or thought to be talking too much, we think that they're less competent. So, you know, there's a, a classic social psychology study which takes two CEOs and one's called John and one's called Jennifer. And they're given a description, you know, this person is someone who talks rather more than other people, as CEOs <laughs> tend to do, of course. Uh, and people are asked to rate them on their competence. For a man, a male CEO talking more than other people, actually, uh, people deem him to be more competent. But if it's a woman, if it's Jennifer, they deem her to be less competent. So women, again, they have to learn to talk just enough to be taken seriously, but not too much to be thought incompetent. I mean, basically women have to have the, the agility of an Olympic gymnast on a balance beam to get this sort of thing right. Whereas men can just saunter along the floor. 
And we have the same problem with uh, self-promotion. So, and, and I think this really comes from childhood. So if you look at little boys talking and playing together, a lot of what they're doing is boasting and being competitive. So they'll say, my dad's got a better car than yours, or I can kick the ball further than you, or I've scored more goals than you. And that's actually the way in which they bond. And therefore that is a proved, you know, that, 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 that is a, a, a learnt form of behavior, which earns some approval from their peers. Now for girls, it's exactly the other way around. So if as a girl, you start boasting about yourself, other girls will really disapprove and they will shun you and ignore you and, you know, push you out of their group. So in order to bond as a girl, you have to say, oh, I'm useless at maths or, oh, my bum's too big. Oh, I hate my hair. And it's admitting this sort of weakness and vulnerability that makes other girls bond with you and approve of you. And this continues into adulthood. So uh, women who boast are actually um, sort of rejected, not just by men, but by women as well. And uh, again, social psychology studies show that women who self-promote um, are penalized in the workplace, whereas men who self-promote are rewarded. And this is very difficult because if you want to get on in your career, you have to be able to tell people that you're good at things. Um, but if you do tell people you're good at things, they will tend to dislike you. You're allowed as a woman to promote other people. So you're allowed to say, my team is fantastic, but you're not allowed to say, I've done really good work. So what is the consequence of all this? The consequence I'm afraid to say is that women find it much harder to influence a group of other people than men do. And when I say the group of other people, that is people including other women. So there have been experiments done. Uh, there's one, for instance, uh, in which uh, a group, a mixed sex group of people were asked to decide a child custody case. And they were given lots of information about the family. And some people were given uh, information, only one person was given that piece of information, and for some only two were given it, and for some the whole group was given it, and then they had to discuss the case and come to a conclusion. And what the psychologist found was that a piece of information offered by a man was twice as likely to be used in the final deliberation than a piece of information offered by a woman. And if the information had been given to only one person, it was five times more likely to be used if offered by a man than by a woman. So these are the problems that women have to deal with. There are all sorts of ways that we can try to narrow the authority gap, but it, there's no one silver bullet because the problem is that it's lots of little problems that accumulate like compound interest over a woman's lifetime to make her less successful in her career generally than a man. And therefore there are lots of small things that we have to do in order to try to counteract that. And, and actually at the end of my book, I've got 140 <laughs> solutions to this problem of the authority gap, which starts with how we raise our children uh, and ends with what governments and society can do. But I think I'll probably have my 10 minutes, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Marvellous, Marianne. Thank you very much. And I will, we will come round to the solutions. I thought uh, your, the, your array of solutions that you have in your final chapter for uh, us as individuals, as colleagues, as partners, as employers, uh, as teachers, and so forth, was fascinating. And we, I think we, it would be great to pick some of those out. Um, but uh, we'll, do, we'll do that uh, during the discussion. I'm going to hand over to Ian Robertson, who has um, an impressive virtual background of um, Trinity College's long room uh, library behind him. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Marianne, for a beautiful, um, succinct and elegant and persuasive talk. Um, whenever I speak to people about confidence, the, the only people that seem ever to say, what's the problem, are white middle-class privileged males like myself. Um, anyone who is uh, lower socioeconomic status, certain racial groups, certain physical appearance disability, um, see themselves as old. I don't see myself as old. <laughs> and, 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 and women. I've never met one who doesn't realize that confidence is a huge problem. And I would submit, Marianne, I think you've talked about this, this is a huge factor in the authority, the authority gap. 
And I confess, I was, I am one of these privileged white middle class males who only in researching a book on confidence, which my wife to, told me to, to write, <laughs> did I fully appreciate everything you've been, the, 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 the weight of disadvantage that women are facing both unconsciously and consciously in the world, both internally in the brains, but also collectively in, in, in culture. So it was, a, and I ended up writing two long chapters, having at least, I guess, about a third of the book focused on this, this issue. So um, you mentioned about speaking time, Mary Ann. That's such an interesting um, topic. So. There's a study done at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon on um, problem solving, IQ type problem solving. Now we know that individual IQ, intelligence quotient, predicts problem solving ability. But this uh, study looked at group IQ, small groups, how good the small groups were at solving in individual problems, intellectual problems. And what they found was the group, the, uh, the IQ of a group was not the mean of the IQs of the individuals in the group. Instead, the group's ability to solve a problem is predicted by three things. The first thing was the fairness of the distribution of speaking time in the group as they tried to solve the problem. The second was the average ability of each member of the group to read emotional expressions in the other members or, or generally. And thirdly, the proportion of women in the group. Now, the proportion of women in the group was explained entirely by their better ability, women's better ability at reading emotional expression. So what this told me was, um, if you have the kind of phenomenon that you were talking about, Mary, of men, you know, women being uh, disempowered from speaking because of these prejudices you're talking about. You're not only disadvantaging women, you're disadvantaging the human race's ability to solve problems collectively. So you're diminishing the group IQ of the human race by this inequitable uh, uh, series of, of barriers to women's participation that you so beautifully described. The second thing I would like to say is about, you mentioned about influence, women's influence, their authority gap, their ability to persuade. Most of us who are not depressed are slightly overconfident. We overestimate our ability slightly. We all think we're above average drivers. We all think we're above average skill in whatever our professional domain is. Men, much more so than women. However, if um, the trouble with being overconfident is, it buys you status. And it buys you status, therefore making you more persuasive. And this is true even if the ground, your, 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 your overconfidence, or let's call it bullshitting, even if that is exposed publicly, your overconfidence your, your status is undiminished, even by revealing the fact that you're overconfident in your own abilities. So this means that bullshitting is a very valuable commodity that men have much more than women. And the, the, the PISA study across the OECD countries of educational attainment, very, a couple of years ago, very cleverly smuggled in, asked people to children or adolescents to rate a number of mathematical concepts in terms of how familiar, how much they knew them and understood them on a, a zero to 10 rating scale. Zero, never heard of it. 10, know it and understand it completely. But they cleverly smuggled in five non-existent terms in among the, the, the real mathematical terms. And what they found, so you then got an ob objective measure of bullshitting ability, of bullshitting tendency. And yes, they found enormous uh, male-female differences, 
We also found cultural differences. The biggest degree of bullshitting was in North America. The lowest was in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, but this, this, but also the, the, the children who were overconfident in this way, who were bullshitting, were actually in a number of other domains more successful because the, the awful truth about overconfidence is because it buys, because it empowers you to do stuff, to take action, it increases your chances of success. And, and also it persuades other people. So it makes them more likely to afford that success. So this is the ghastly reality about um, so this attribute that males have more than women over confidence, which diminishes our species group intelligence, disempowers half, half the species and is supported by a large number of brain mechanisms. I'm not going to, maybe can come up in the discussion, but many of which, um, Marianne, you have alluded to here. So I, I want to just summarize four things I'm not going to talk about, just to say there's four areas. Perception of competence is one of them, which is confounded with masculinity. The, um, the, the approach to competition, the way that women's, as you correctly described, women's self-representation uh, in the brain is more collective. And so indiv ruthless individual competition is personally painful for women in a way that it's not for men. Um, the antidote's collective confidence, the, that, that attribute of of, of collectivism in women can be harnessed and was indeed harnessed in American politics, midterm Trump elections. And finally, the role of action, of committed action in uh, affording, by uh, allowing and enabling women to take more action, you can actually improve their confidence because of the link between confidence and action. I'll finish there. Marvellous. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. And um, I'm, I, I note that uh, the Scots are among the most self-deprecatory people in the world. So uh, <laughs> and, uh, we are, uh, few exceptions. With a few exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Now, what, let me, uh, I think we should move on to how, how we can um, uh, solve these problems. But I'm just going to press on a sort of a Japanese context for it, even though neither of you and I'm not, I'm not, trying to make you experts on Japan, because I know that uh, neither of you are, but we, some of what both of you have said ought to lead one to expect that actually women would have done rather well in Japan. Um, you said that women are more communal in their think in their approach rather than individually co competitive. Well, Japan is quintessentially a communal society. Uh, in which the group matters more than anything. Japanese corporations are ones in which individualism, individual indiv incentives for kind of uh, performance for individuals are not like on Wall Street and uh, so forth, a dog eat dog. It's much more steady um, uh, growth and so forth. Of course, competence um, and other perceptions make a difference to, to, to uh, success, but nevertheless, it's not an individualistic society. Collectivism, collective confidence. Well, again, that's Japan really in some ways. And yet Japan is much lower um, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, the position of women um, on all, almost every, every measure. Um, what do you think it is in this quite communal society, very group oriented society in which nevertheless, um, women um, might not be able to prosper. Um, Ian, what's, what's, what's your sort of uh, immediate judgment on that? We might draw some questions in from, from people on this. Uh, so I'm a hypothesis that um, group, I, 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 possible, it's possible that males, the collective bonding of males in Japan may create the, the, the dynamics we know about outgroup stereotyping and outgroup um, uh, objectification. And so it, it's, it's, it's in some ways, it's much the, 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 the negative effects of dominance of one person over another that we see in male, female individual relationships is multiplied enormously 
when you have this, uh, this embedded in a group identity and a group dominance. So I think if the, if, if, if the, the, the group culture is such that the beliefs about the group in relation to another group embody such an asymmetry, then it makes sense for me that that would have much more per pervasive effect than where there's more variability between individual hierarchies and more, more flexibility of hierarchies to evolve where women are not maintained systematically at a lower level. That's just a hypothesis. No, I think that, that that's a very good and interesting hypothesis. I mean, one one aspect, and I'll pass this over to you, Marianne, but one aspect, of course, of a Japanese corporation is that bonding is vitally important. Um, you are really bonding into a group, and indeed, generally, in your role in a Japanese organization, you are rotated quite quickly through roles, so perhaps every two, three, four years, which means that then bonding with your team, whoever the team is, becomes vitally important and the ability, therefore, to be out drinking until 10 o'clock at night becomes rather important um, uh, and so forth, as it were, that rapid bonding um, become, becomes more necessary. But uh, do you have a, 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 a thought, Marianne? Uh, well, I don't have any great insight or expert insight into Japan, I'm afraid, and you know more about this than, than I do, Bill. Um, but there is, I mean, part of the problem for women is that there is often a great deal of affinity bias. So as well as gender bias, affinity bias means that you prefer people who are like you and which is why men are much more likely to promote other men than women, even in individualistic Western societies. So in uh, I think it was an American study that showed that 70 percent of men uh, will rate a man higher than a woman, even when they've achieved exactly the same goals. And this rises to 75 percent for men in senior positions. So, which means that promotion really isn't meritocratic. If you're a woman, you can achieve, you can be just as good as a man, but if a man is doing the hiring or promotion, he's much more likely to choose another man. And so I think if, if, you, are, if you live in a culture in which there is also a lot of bonding at a corporate level, that affinity bias, I, suggest, I, I should imagine, would increase. I actually think that that's a, a spot on I mean, I, I, in my perception of it, but um, our questioners will probably chip in on this. But and that, but it, as you say, it's not only in in Japan. There's a report on um, mediocre middle, man, middle male middle managers in the city of London in financial services that's just been causing a bit of uh, a bit of. Uh, um, a wave, a wave in London, and uh, I think a, a piece about it in today's FT is precisely about this, about affinity bias, um, yeah. uh, as you put it. Uh, um, Hella Torning Schmidt, who is the former Prime Minister of Denmark, said to me, "Well, no, will have achieved true equality when there is many mediocre men. Uh, sorry, as many mediocre women in senior positions as mediocre men." <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Penilla Rudlin, who's um, uh, board member of the Japan Society, but runs, runs a, um, a, a consultancy about uh, sort of col cultural comparisons um, between Japanese and, and European companies. Um, she asks, is there any research on collectivist cultures such as Japan, whether the degree of bullshit in men is higher or lower than in Anglo-Saxon cultures? Um, in your, you, you talked about the range of bullshit, uh, Ian, um, across, across the Atlantic. Has it gone across the Pacific, that research? Unfortunately, I don't know about gender differences, but yes, there have been there have been different uh, comparisons of um, collectivist East Asian countries um, in terms of uh, the role of um, overconfidence, and it is definitely overconfidence is at a premium in high less less of an important factor in collectivist culture. So I don't, I don't know about the, the, the gender gap. That's a very interesting question. There have been interesting studies in China between the wheat and the rice growing areas. And rice growing is traditionally a communal activity um, and wheat growing more individual. And these tendencies embed themselves in the culture. And indeed, Southern China has more collectivist um, uh, north more individualistic, and you, you get exactly the same differences in all sorts of um, uh, thinking. That, uh, uh, and, and the role of overconfidence seems to be much more necessary for the societal change 
and where people perceive there's going to be change, then overconfidence becomes a necessary and valuable uh, commodity. Where there is stability, overconfidence is less of a value and, and, and communal emotions like shame tend to be much more important. Sheila um, Malin um, has asked uh, Marianne, what behaviors should male feminist stroke allies focus on to help reduce the authority gap? Which brings into your, to your, um, to your list of, uh, of uh, things that we can all do. Yeah. Um, but uh, perhaps to start that question of how we can, how we can make a difference. Um, okay, well, I suppose I, I, let's start at work as colleagues. Um, so a man can, first of all, make sure he's not doing the bad things that the authority gap, gap tends to encourage, such as not listening to women attentively, talking over them, interrupting them. Um, allow them just as much conversational time as you have if you're a man. I mean, quite often we women are talking to a man and he does what I call conversational manspreading. He just takes up too much of the conversational time and it's very hard to get a word in edgeways. So that helps. Affirming what a woman says at a meeting. If you're a man, you can be a very good ally by uh, saying, oh yeah, I really, I really agree with Marianne's point there and I think we should do it. And that will make the other men in the meeting perk up. So that helps a lot. Men tend to affirm what other men say at meetings, but they're much less likely to affirm what women say at meetings. Um, if you're a man in a, in a relatively senior position and you're looking for someone to mentor or to sponsor, instead of automatically choosing someone who looks and feels like you were when you were young, go for a woman rather than a man. That would be extremely helpful. Uh, at home, the best thing you can do is to share all the household chores and childcare equally. That makes the most enormous difference to a woman's ability to advance in her career and to her confidence and to her exhaustion levels. Um, and the great thing is <clears throat> all the research shows that in more gender equal partnerships where women and men share the chores pretty much equally, not only are the women happier and healthier and do better at work, which you would imagine, the children are, if you have them, are happier and healthier and have fewer behavioral problems and do better at school. But counterintuitively, perhaps the man is also happier and healthier, is half as likely to get depressed, is twice as likely to be satisfied with his life, drinks less, smokes less, takes fewer drugs, sleeps better at night. And this I'm afraid is the complete clincher, will get more frequent and better sex. So <laughs> that's the key, uh, key incentive. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> it is. I thought of mentioning in my introduction. There is a, not about sex, but there is a um, a beautifully set up scene in the um, movie The Post about the Washington Post in the Pentagon Papers era, where um, Catherine Graham is uh, chairing a board meeting um, and. Um, of, of all uh, white males, and um, none of them listen at all to what she said. Um, uh, and it's a sort of, it's obviously meant to be a stereotypical scene, but I thought it, I think it's worth um, men watching this to see, see themselves at work um, in, in, in those, in those uh, circumstances. So Ian, I mean, let's say that you're, you're coaching some male managers. Um, uh, and the question is, You've got a you've got a, a diverse team of, of uh, juniors coming up. How do you help boost the confidence of of uh, and of the women so that you can, as a company, get the most out of them uh, uh, and get the the best of their abilities out of them? What, what what do you say to your to your clients if you were if you were in that situation? To the men or to the women or to both? Well, to both. To 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 the to the managers. And so I've, I've stereotyped the managers as being male because most of them will be at present. But, um, but uh, nevertheless, let's say they're male or female managers. Yeah. yeah. The males are a tougher nut to crack um, because as I, as I said, the, uh, the, the, the more privileged you are in a hierarchy, the more blind you are to the, to the dynamics of that, of that hierarchy. And so I, I would say, first of all, I would say um, certain corporations um, tend to uh, have mechanisms that 
help correct what, say, in, in universities or in, in public services, it was less common, the notion that you are rated by people below you, the 360 degree uh, assessment of you by people over whom you have uh, some power. And it's much, it's much harder in, say, big tech companies. It's much harder for the kind of gross abuse So I, I think the thing to do with men is you have to explain to, to make them see, to, to try and build awareness and, and to make them aware of their lack of awareness of what's going on. Because men, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on before I researched this book, which is appalling. You know, it's appalling that I didn't know. So <laughs> all men have to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary Ann's book. I'm like, <laughs> Mary Ann's book, Mary Ann. Can, I, can yeah. I add to that? I mean, yeah. you're, you're so right, Ian. I think making men aware of their bias is really going to help. And, you know, a lot of us think, oh, we're too intelligent or we're too liberal minded, or whatever, to be biased. No, even I'm biased and I've written a whole book about it. Um, yeah. It's called Unconscious for a reason. OK, so what we need to do is be much more aware of when the those sneaky little stereotypes start playing tricks with our brains. So, for instance, um, research has shown that when evaluations are done of women and of men, women are much more likely to, to have the grindstone adjectives used about them. Oh, she's conscientious, she's diligent, she's hardworking. Whereas men are much more likely to have adjectives like outstanding and talented um, and brilliant. Even if women are as outstanding and brilliant as men, people tend to put it down to hard work rather than innate talent. So you know, if you're writing an evaluation of somebody, just stop and check if those are the sort of words you're using about a woman rather than a man. If the sort of adjectives that come up in your head when you see a woman being competent and confident are abrasive and strident, ask yourself, is that perhaps saying more about me than about her? Because it probably is. And if you start finding yourself mistaking confidence for competence, again, try and bring yourself up short and judge people by their actual output and by their work and not by how good they tell you they are. No, excellent Absolutely. advice. Absolutely. Yeah, stop and think on every possible occasion, really, yeah. in, in this. Now, there's a, a comment, stroke question, come in from uh, Yoko Dochi, who is, works for SoftBank. Um, and uh, she, uh, she works in London, but obviously she's worked for a long time in, in Japan for SoftBank as well. And uh, Dochi-san says, it's absolutely correct that group matters in Japan Inc. This complicates the issue for Japanese women. In my experience at Japan Inc. over 30 years, to have our women's voice heard, we need to start by, quotes, acting like men and do it well and better. That's the only way to gain status to have our voice heard, bit by bit, repeatedly, persistently over years. This is, however, essentially a self-help strategy. Do presenters see better alternatives? Now, this is a familiar question. Do women need to act like men? Um, or, or do women need to act like better cases of women. Um, well, I, I, often, thought, Mary -Anne? I often think that instead of sending women on assertiveness training courses, we should send men on bullshit avoidance courses. <laughs> <laughs> why, why should we have, I mean, there are two problems. One is that if we do start acting like men, as I explained in the beginning, people often don't like it. So that's part of the problem. Um, and actually all the management literature is suggesting that if men, would start acting more like women, we would actually have better leadership. So, you know, but, but the best leadership on the whole is collaborative and democratic, not too hierarchical. It's what uh, people call transformational leadership and women on the whole are better at trans transformational leadership than men are. So, I mean, I would love men to start behaving a bit more like women, but unfortunately we are in the world we are in and um, yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult to get it right. Ian. I, I, I'm struck. I'm struck by the amount of resources and companies involved in doing financial audits of companies and corporations, where actually some of the greatest risks have to do with abuse of power and a set of behaviors, often very male behaviors, that um 
of, of the kind that you're describing, uh, Marianne, that are associated with overconfidence and the effects of power in the brain. So it strikes me that, yes, you can try and train middle managers to be aware of these things, absolutely. And the answer is yes, do that. But it's, the, it's from the very, these things come from the very top. It's the culture of an organization, the extent to which this organization says that ruthless dog eat dog competitiveness, you know, and, and you know, the Trump organization famously, he just loved to see people fighting. You know, it was, it was this, this competitive environment that women just hate and, are, you know, and are, it's, it's, it's bad for group IQ. So if we had a system where we required the kind of audit for, for both the unconscious biases you're talking about, Marianne, but also the, the other behaviors and relationships, um, so that there was a report to the board that in our meetings, <laughs> here is the percentage of time that uh, different people spoke. Uh, here is the um, he, he, here here are the our, our unconscious bias measures from the implicit association test of our employees. If you did that uh, at a corporate level, that could have enormous impact on on this. Let's just uh, push um, a bit further on this question about leadership and uh, women leaders. You've got a passage in your book, um, Ian, about uh, oh, uh, the the issue, the question of whether female uh, political leaders during the pandemic have uh, have, have uh, whether there's a real cause and effect in um, as were the superiority of uh, of performance in uh, New Zealand, in Germany, in Taiwan, um, and uh, and other cases. Um, yeah. What what is the real evidence, and what what is the the, the belief? Uh, what is your belief about um, about the real difference? Given given that we know that we're 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 different, we're just overlapping parts of the bell curves. We've got different different um, characteristics, but uh, of different women and different men. So, I mean, that was more illustrative, but the, you know, you you couldn't claim cause and effect about the women leaders doing better in the pandemic. Uh, tend to be smaller countries and uh, also the, 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 the societies they came from generated a woman leader. So that so, so all, we have to think of all of that. That being said, the, the meta-analyses, as Mary Ann has shown, the meta-analyses show that uh, men are more likely to be promo promoted or given the job in the interview panel. But once in it, overconfident people are actually no better at doing the job, in many cases worse and that women's leadership, women's style of leadership, depending on which studies you look at, it may on average be better than men's if they get to that, that position. So my, my view is we, we, we need, just like in the marriages that Marianne was talking about, of where, where everyone is happier, the children, the, the man and the woman, uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that in societies and, and corporations, that, that, that if you can uh, achieve that, that kind of parity, you're going to get better mental health. Um, now, I uh, just, there was a problem here, which uh, uh, was a study, which hopefully maybe in, in the current generation is less uh, prevalent, but men, men's well-being in a marriage or partnership increases as the woman's salary increases up to 40% of the total household income. After that, it decreases. So by the, the time the woman's salary is 100%, it's as low, their well-being is as low as it was when it's zero. So men, are un, men of my generation and younger generations, hopefully not the very youngest ones, are uncomfortable if they're not financially dominant in a partnership. And successful women who get promoted um, become less able to find partners because, because of this reluctance of men to um, to uh, uh, you know to, to to be in a relationship where they're not the, the top dog in terms of in terms of earning, and this this is where the, the whole concept of maleness and um, the, the the whole we see in leaders there are there are very few female Erdogans, Putins, Trumps. Okay, there was Indira Gandhi and there was Empress Irene of Byzantium, but there are not many of them. We'll have to see as more leaders come. But to me, my heroine is Angela, Angela Merkel, who has wielded enormous power without being 
showing any of the, 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 the terrible effects that power has on many, many male leaders. Marianne, what's, what's, what, well, perhaps you might comment on this question of, as it were, of the, of the income inequity in, uh, and rela in relationships. Is this a real issue or is this, as it were, a, um, a correlation issue? Um, well, I, I think Ian's right that, I, well, I mean, I hope anyway, that, that it is less prevalent among the young. Um, but all this comes down to insecure masculinity. And actually, yeah. I think even with Trump and Bolsonaro and uh, Erdogan and possibly Boris Johnson, you know, the, this sort of blustering overconfidence is also a symptom of insecure masculinity. And um, the most distressing chapter I wrote in my book was about the backlash to women showing authority or even just, a, <laughs> even just voicing opinions. Um, uh, you know, the really horrendous social media trolling, uh, escalating even to rape and death threats. And, you know, this is all about insecure masculinity as well. And of course, not all men, you know, lots of men are completely comfortable in their masculinity and therefore don't feel threatened by women. And they're the men on the whole who we really love. Um, and, and if only the others who do feel threatened by um, authoritative women or indeed women even expressing opinion could sort themselves out psychically, I think the world would be in a much better place. I'll read out uh, another question um, from a, a, a Japanese woman on the um, on the call. Yuriko Takemura says, in my view, Japanese gender inequality is based on males protectionism rooted in patriarchy. Some, somewhat connected to what you're saying, um, Marianne. Thus, some females feel comfortable with their quote, traditional position. But on the other hand, indeed, some males think they think they the men carry too much pressure and some females feel restricted. Do you think that increasing rights for the LGBTQ is essential to increase females' rights in Japan due to the cultural dimension? Well, that's obviously a complicated package there, but um, is, uh, is there part of the issue here in, in, well, in to, uh, unpacking the, the, the binary questions about, uh, about uh, male and female characteristics? Gosh, that is complicated, isn't it? Um... I mean, I, I, I suspect that a lot of homophobia from men is also down to insecure masculinity. Um, but I'm not a psychotherapist, but I should imagine that's the case. And, and it's certainly true that the patriarchal bargain, as it's known, whereby women agree to uh, have very traditional female roles and men are in charge of the breadwinning and have the power, uh, doesn't always suit men either. Uh, and I think your questioner was right there that, you know, some men actually would genuinely prefer not to have all the responsibility of the breadwinning and, and the looking after the family and, uh, and find sort of toxic masculinity as unpleasant for them as it is for women. Um, I would just like both sides of a couple to be able to choose how they want to lead their life um, and, and not be, uh, you know, not be oppressed either by the other or, or by society. Um, but I, I, to what extent does um, improving LGBT rights improve the lot of women? Uh, I mean, I think there is a correlation on the whole, you know, the more liberal a society is, the better they're likely to treat women and the more accepting they're likely to be of LGBTQ people. You know, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting um, how authoritarian cultures, how, uh, their attitudes to women and to LGBTQ people are go hand in hand, and you know the, the legislation in Hungary and in Russia the, makes me think that there, there's something about this toxic masculinity you were describing, Marianne, that's inherent in the the addiction to power and the the investment in highly authoritarian systems that is, is essentially the core, you know, the dis distillation of maleness. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why the, hom the you know, homosexuality and not gender uh, differences are such a threat. Um, and there's this, you know, I, I'm just struck by Putin, Russia, just to what extent his whole behavior has been driven by a sense of personal humiliation by the West. Um, uh, 
the sense and, and, and how he's, he's managed to embody that in a country which is economically going terribly, yet has been both, has kept this person in power, not all of them by any means, um, as a means of preserving this particular uh, concept of, of self that is tied in with um, uh, male chauvinism and, and, and the opposition to LGBTQ. So I couldn't say it's cause and effect, but there's a very interesting constellation of associations there. Now, Martin Hatful has put in a question. Um, he says, uh, observes that Scandinavia and no or Nordic nations perform well on objective gender equality measures, women in parliament, senior business roles, etc. Is there evidence that the authority gap is proportionately smaller there? And if so, why is education the key? Marianne, is there, uh, is there, are we all, are we all um, hankering to be Scandinavia? Yeah, I, I'm hankering to be Scandinavian. But on the other hand, I'm also pleased that I'm, you know, British and not Saudi. So, you know, there is a spectrum and, you know, Britain is, is, is a lot better than a lot of other countries. So, um, yeah. I don't actually, I'm afraid I don't know about specific evidence of, of the authority gap in Scandinavia because actually most of the studies have been done by American uh, sociologists and social psychologists. Um, but I would imagine that the effect of greater gender equality in, in those Nordic countries means that in everyday interactions, um, men are more respectful of women. I do happen to know just anecdotally, my daughter lives in Denmark and is an architect there. And she says that she finds it, um, uh, yeah, more, more equal than here, and she's treated with more respect there than here. It introduces a question in my mind, which I was thinking of ending on, but actually we're still a few minutes to go, but I'll still pop it in now because it's relevant, is whether both of you see this as being, as it were, is this a transitional situation that we've been describing, or is it an, an inherent one that we will be always battling against with various shades of success? Um, I, it, I, reading in your book, Marianne, about Helle Thorning Schmidt and... Um, um, her anger at having to dress in a very sort of particularly serious way in order to be take seri taken seriously in, in, in Danish politics brings this to my mind. Um, uh, are Hella's successors now not having to think in the same way or is it, or is it a, as it were, an, eter um, is it an eternal part of life? Well, actually being the second or third woman in a job is much easier than being the first. She was the first female Danish prime minister. There's now a second. And I know Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, who's the third female prime minister in that country, says it is so much easier for her than it is for first female prime ministers or first female anythings. So I do think that as we get more women into authoritative positions, our unconscious bias that always equates male with authority will start to dissipate. It has already started to happen um, over the course of the past 15 or 20 years. Our unconscious bias has fallen by about six or seven points. But that's down from, you know, 70 something to late 60s. So uh, there's still quite a lot there. And if, it, and if it happens only at that rate, I'm afraid we've got a very long time to go. But, you know, women are in a much better position now in 2021 than they were in the 1950s, say. Uh, all I'm saying is, can we please hurry this along a bit? <laughs> and, and I think if we're just more aware of the problems, and particularly if men are more aware of the problem, I think we can accelerate progress. That's what I'm hoping for. Whether we'll ever close the gap altogether, I doubt. Ian. I, I, I think the, there are certain biases there that are so um, strongly wired in the brain that I think it's going to be a constant struggle. I do agree completely with Mary Ann is improving uh, uh, significantly, but just the, the confusion of competence and masculinity in the brain, for instance, in, when you look at a face for less than a second, um, and then the other thing is power, is the, the effects of power on people's brains and the effects of wealth on people's brain, because power and wealth go. They, Bertram Russell said power is to human relations what energy is to physics. And it, we underestimate just the, the transformational effects that power has on the individual brains of people. So we have to have more women in power they are less vulnerable to its toxic addictive effects, less likely to be corrupted by it, though it does happen. Um, and it, you know, to me, the, the, the question of the authority gap is, 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 is actually a question not just about 
the unfairness and injustice of this. And it's not just about the loss of human capital we're getting for this. It's actually about the survival of the planet. Yeah. Because dealing with dealing with climate change, dealing with globalization and the mass migration, dealing with problems of inequ in the huge accelerating inequality, all these enormous problems the planet is facing will not be possible unless we have a lot more, many, many more senior women leaders uh, bringing their uh, approach uh, to, 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 to the world, which I believe combined with that of enlightened men is, is going to be a, the critical ingredient in, in tackling these issues. I, can, I, can I just add, I so agree with that. I liked your phrase combined with the talents of enlightened men, because actually my ideal would be that in any organization at any level, the default is that you have a man and a woman running it. So and it may, might be that the woman is a chair and the man is a CEO, or you know the, the man is a, a sort of middle manager and the woman is his deputy or the other way around. But it's this complementarity between male and female viewpoints that actually is incredibly creative. Um, I, I, men on the whole behave better and I think think better when there are many more women in the room and, 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 and probably the same is true the other way around. So I would love to see that sort of society where just automatically you have a man and a woman running things at every level. And of course, the lovely byproducts of that is you get true gender equality as well. Great idea. Great thought. I'm just I'm going to finish by um, just summarizing some of the questions I haven't got to because a lot of them are really comments. Um, one asks about uh, cultural bias in affinity biased decisions uh, where stereotypes can affect particularly minority women. And I would recommend uh, reading some uh, aspects of uh, some chapters rather of uh, Marianne's book, which uh, deals specifically this question. Margaret Jennings asks particularly about public school boys with a thought in Britain. Um, networking, elitism, power, confidence, class, the way in which these things become self-reinforcing particularly, and that's particularly a male thing. Yumio Yamamoto has said that as a returnee from abroad to Japan, she feels she can get away with murder as Japanese don't expect her to be normal, but she does find it easier to get on if she shows a bit of quotes weakness. She thinks the current enemy or rival of women is other women, typically. Uh, Pinilla Rudlin has asked another question about the impact of disorders such as autism and dyspraxia, whether uh, females are better at masking these disorders and they're not being diagnosed. And that uh, may be, uh, whereas in men, these things are often seen as she puts it as a sign of genius, not, a, not impacting their self-esteem. Um, question about uh, female teachers in, in kindergarten and uh, the way in which they, they uh, feel like uh, embed these things into, into culture. So a great range of questions. Uh, Tageshi Hajiro of Mitsui and Co uh, says uh, the number one culprit holding back women's confidence in Japan are of course the male population, but second, mothers who push old value judgments onto their daughters. And third, female fear, peers for competing with, with one another. Well, perhaps that is a transitional question. I'll end with an optimistic view about Japan. Um, I do think that more women getting into leadership positions has only just begun in Japan, particularly with, of course, Governor Koike of uh, Tokyo and uh, the mayor of Yokohama, um, both uh, very successful uh, political leaders. Um, it's that sort of example that then makes power both to be exercised in a new way, but also um, to become more uh, acceptable and normal. Uh, and Japan hasn't yet reached anywhere near the point of where it's a normality to see a woman in, in a leadership position. I don't think Britain has quite either, but it's closer to, to normal uh, in Britain than, uh, than in Japan. Mm -hmm. So let me thank Marianne Seekhart and Ian Robertson for a fascinating discussion, for sharing uh, your time with us today and I wish you the best of luck with both of your books and especially with um, convincing and training managers and uh, colleagues and others both male and female to think in a in a more constructive and more productive way about this issue. Thank you to all of the audience who've taken part and for all your excellent questions and see you again soon. Have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you Bill. Thank you Marianne. Thank you. Thank you.